Several months ago, I interviewed Nagpur Chogyam, an English blues-playing Nagpur and teacher of Tibetan Buddhism. Nagpur Chogyam was one of the most popular and discussed guests that I've had on my series, and the interview is a personal favorite of mine. Since that time, we kept in touch, and in December 2018, I went down to the deepest Wales to visit Nagpur Chogyam and his wife and teaching partner, Kandra Dechen, at their home. A big part of the way that Nagpur Chogyam and Kandra Dechen teach is through the way that they live their lives. And as such, in this video, we go on a tour of their house, their shrine room, their music and writing spaces. We find out how appreciation for the shape of a Fender Telecaster is actually an entryway to compassion. Nagpur Chogyam takes us on a tour of his personal wardrobe and explains how he takes, as he puts it, sartorialism as an art form. We talk about crazy wisdom and why that's different from the sort of guru abuse that we hear so commonly about today. They also talk candidly about the controversy around their being reincarnated lamas and Nagpur Chogyam being a treasure revealer. We even have a blues jam. <laughs> That's just some of what we talk about. I think you're going to find it very, very interesting. So without further ado, let's get to it. So this through here is the scullery, which used to be a walkway through for the horses that came stable. Here's a bathroom. Here the frogs are a theme. You, you get frog presents all the time. <laughs> <laughs> we do. This is the shrine room, as you can see. Padmasambhava, Yishitsogyal, this one's Arulingma. This is one you won't recognize. Uh, Arulingma is the origin of the Tama. Uh, this is Aruyeshe, this is the son of Arulingma, and his two consorts who were sisters. This is Ashikandro, and this is Ayekandro. Ayakandro is the previous incarnation of Khandra Dechen. In this cow here, this is uh, Jomu Sampel. She's the Sanyum of our teacher, Kunzan Dojo Rinpoche. This you don't see very often. This is Mengtse. In the largest Nyingma Gompas, there'll always be a statue of Mengtse there because he represents the lineage of 80 Chan masters in the Nyingma tradition. And my father brought this one back from China in... Um, Ooh, 1937, and it was always in our home, and I inherited it, and um, my father always called him Confucius, although he's not. He's, uh, I don't know the Chinese name from the Tibetans call him Mengzi, which means the long life man. Why is that particular purba wrapped at the back there? Uh, that's wrapped because it's the one that is in use, and so the top of it is hidden unless it's being used. There are many different kinds of symbolic practice around Purba. Mm -hmm. um, fundamentally, stabbing, attraction, aversion, and indifference. So if one has them, one stabs them. <laughs> in there also, there's a hammer. We had it made in, in, in Finland because Dujan Rinpoche said that Scandinavia was a hidden land. And um, there's a connection between the, the old Norse um, deities and, and the protectors. So Thor is very much like Doji Legpa. So this is made of oak, this is Finnish oak. We've got a Vajra terminal here. But we were looking for something that looked like Thor's hammer. Of course, if you Google Thor's hammer, you get Marvel magazines. <laughs> And that's all you find. Uh, we then found some kind of Victorian picture of Thor that had a different kind of hammer, but it was quite ornate and obviously not a, a working hammer. And then one of our students found these uh, in the Helsinki Museum. And this is a, a Neolithic hammer head. Well, this isn't, but um, it, it's, it's an exact copy of it. And there were about 20 or 30 of them. They all had exactly this shape. As soon as I saw it, I thought, this is the one we'll use, uh, because it's such a strange thing. You wonder why somebody ever made it with this undercut here. 
which should surely weaken it if it was made of stone. What, what the purpose could have been, I have no idea. But uh, Anyway, so that's the one we chose for the hammer of uh, Doge Legpa. Doge Legpa is one of the three major Nima protectors. You know, the, the Maza Dosum, uh, Mamu Ekejati. They're just down there. In the yeah, there we are. Mamu Ekejati, Zara Hula, and this one is Doge Legpa. Those are heads from a very large statue, a uh, Rossville statue, a garland of 52 severed heads which represent the 52 neurotic concepts. Although this room <laughs> represents ritual to a large degree, our major practice is silent sitting, but all this is Maha Yoga, and there's a certain extent of our practice that is Maha Yoga, because I've also practiced... Um, Dujram Tear, because um, the previous uh, Dujram Rinpoche was, was my first major teacher. Mm. And so I, I have um, uh, Dujram Tear practices that I keep up. Is this where you practice? Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 And if we, um, we sometimes give empowerments here, if we have um, students who come wishing a certain kind of empowerment, then this is the place we give it. And we have these chairs because we're altar carcass, as, as it were, <laughs> aged and infirm, and um, uh, they're slightly more comfortable than um, yeah. sitting on a throne. Mm. Thrones are very un un mm. un uncomfortable. In our tradition, it's not particularly important where you sit, or what, you don't have to sit on the floor. Right. You just sit where you're comfortable so that you're not distracted by discomfort. Do you, in your uh, tradition, teach yogas of the channels and this yes, sort of thing? Yes, certainly. Salon, yes. Salon, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that require certain postures? Yes. Mm -hmm. For sitting and so on? Lotus and all that sort of thing? Uh, yes, um, some of them do. Um, Tumo does. Um, uh, I'm afraid I was a Tumo reject. Uh, <laughs> How does one become a Tumo reject? Uh, uh, well, uh, by having legs like mine, I, I, one really has to start to mode about the age of between 8 to 12, uh, unless you're extremely fit. And just getting into Lotus was hard enough for me, and I could never really manage it well. But as to leaping from Lotus into the air, well, I couldn't do that anyway. I couldn't get onto my feet. But the um, breathing exercises were extremely good and valuable, and I've kept them up ever since. Who was your teacher for that? It was um, Kukunzang Dojo Rinpoche. He was uh, one of the uh, major Tsalung masters of the 20th century, really. Extraordinary. And what is Tsalung? Tsalung is the uh, manipulation of the subtle winds in the channels and uh, coordinated with breath, uh, there are various exercises, I suppose. Tumo is probably the most well-known, the you know, development of heat. Um, the route I took after I, f after I failed with Tumo was a poa, you know, the um, projection of consciousness. That's where you end up with this stalk of kusha grass in the top of your head. And they push it through the skull. If you can do that and you... Um, pronounce the syllables and it quivers then then you're all set can you do that i did that um, one of our students has just done that in um in boda mm -hmm. she's just um completed a retreat with the arote purva uh, so the arote poa um so that was quite exciting for us mm. to have you know, someone do that it means that at the time of their death they will be able to die consciously and they will be able to actually choose the point at which they die. They'll also be able to help other people with the death process, which is extremely important um, to be able to do that. Um, so it has to do with uh, using the energy of the Tsalung system. Um, oh, people are more familiar probably with um, uh, Nadi, Prana and Bindu. Those are the Sanskrit words, but... Um, Tsalung and Tigli are the Tibetan terms. And so it's getting in contact with that particular energy 
and being able to control that so that uh, one can experience it in a spatial con um, a spatial condition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and what uh, does that practice uh, involve for your student? Um, well, first of all, a great deal of recitation of Lishit Sogyal Mantra and the visualization of Lishit Sogyal. And then basically the visualization of, of a tigli that rises to various different points and then is ejected with the use of certain syllables. And when that's been practiced enough, you eventually get a, a soft spot on, on the top of the head that actually you know, pusses up and cracks open and, and the suture opens a little bit and the, this stalk of kusha grass can be inserted at that point by the teacher. Fortunately, she's got Jomo uh, Sampal Dechen Rinpoche, the um, Sangyum of our teacher out there who's, mm. who's gone through that with her. And, she, and with the delights of WhatsApp, we now have a photograph of her with the kusha grass in her head. How cool is that? That's extraordinary. I think one of the important things... Um, about the Gurkha Changlo Day is that um, practice is integrated with everyday life and work, and so uh, um, one can be in retreat or, or a semi open style of retreat. Actually, retreat is a, is a deeply stupid word. <laughs> uh, the Tibetan word is tsam, which means uh, confines or, or parameters. So you can set the parameters up in, in any way you like, but you have to remain within the parameters that you set. Mm. So, for example, um, our student is a physical therapist, and so during her retreat she had clients at certain times, but the rest of the time was retreat. And it's this um, way of working with everyday life that's really important for people, that you don't actually have to carve out a huge piece mm. of time mm. because that makes it impossible for mm. a lot of people. Yeah, so that's not compatible with working in family life, which mm. is where most of us are. Mm. We don't have independent wealth that we can just take a year off or three years right. off. And this occurred in Tibet as well. It yeah. was quite common in the Nyingma tradition. The um, three-year retreat is, uh, is really only a couple of hundred years old as a formulation, and, but... You know, people now feel that it has to happen, or long retreat has to happen. Mm -hmm. The word for you know, marmot is uh, tsitsigomchen, which means the great meditating rat, i.e., you know, it hibernates. But when it comes out of its period of hibernation, it's still a marmot. <laughs> <laughs> so, hence, uh, you can go into retreat, but it depends what you do in there. The retreat's mm -hmm. not going to. People also go, you know, go to prison for three years and they don't come out realised. Um, so it's um, we tend to lay an emphasis on on uh, short periods of mm. retreat. But the retreats are quite intensive. Yeah. So that will be rising early and going to bed quite late, and every half hour or hour will be accounted for in activity of practice, apart from the breakfast, lunch, and mm. dinner break, which would be an hour each, um, all the rest of the time, will be fairly quickly changing practice, because um, if you're to spend hours in silent sitting, you can very quickly um, get sleepy. So we will in intersperse physical practice with silent sitting, yogic song with silent sitting, so it's quite quickly changing, so it's fresh all the time, because it's quality that's important. So, um, dressing room. Uh, I've always taken um, um, sartorialism to be an art form. What have we got in here? This, one of my favourite things, this is uh, Mr Darcy's dressing gown. Not the actual dressing gown in Pride and Prejudice, but uh, exactly the same model, which was made by the same company that made his. I happen to know a lady who worked there, and she got it made up for me. So, I mean, this is something that anyone can do in particular. 
This is a Georgian coat made in um, Donegal tweed. I love Donegal tweed. It's the hippies tweed. Here it's got these sparkles of, of colour in it. It's amazing stuff. It's actually, you know, it's interesting how clothing is more something for other people than it is for yourself because when you're wearing it, you can't see it. It's other people who are seeing it. And I've always found it makes a nice um, connection with other human beings. People are always saying hello to me. It, it creates a lot of friendliness in life that, mm. that I enjoy. You get lots of nice comments from ladies about your hats as yes. well, don't you? Yeah. Of course, there's a, a, we have our Tibetan robes that we have a variety of different things, but, um, but I generally enjoy wearing you know, traditional clothing, but from all varieties of cultures. Um, I, I've got some various items of Hasidic clothing, a nice Hasidic silk jacket that I bought in one of the shops in Borough Park in New York. That, um, I remember when I was first in New York, I went, um, one of my first students there, I asked him, I said, who are these guys at the airport that dress really sharp, you know? And he said, well, describe him. I said, well, they're all in black. And they have a black hat, white shirt. And I said, they've got these little bits of hair here. And he looked at me and he said, sharp? <laughs> he said, you must be joking. I said, no, I think they're really sharp. Uh, he's Jewish also, but he, he had no way of understanding these people as being sharp. And I said, yeah, I love the way they dress. You know, it's really, they've got real style, those people. And, that came as a shock to him that anyone would find the Hasidim sharp. But... This here is um, a pair of lederhosen, but they're um, carpenter's lederhosen, so they're long. They don't make them anymore. I had a pair when I was young that belonged to my uncle. I got them made up again by a gentleman in Austria who fortunately knew what I was talking about and was able to remake them. And then on top I've got a thing that's entirely untraditional, which is a, the six-pocket waistcoat, which is my particular creation, because I like having a, a walking filing cabinet. You mentioned the impact on others is... Is primary, but does it give you a certain feeling to dress that way? Yeah, it gives me a sense that I'm relieving people of what would other be the horrid experience of seeing me. <laughs> <laughs> they get something slightly more pleasant to look at. But there is an aspect of practice in all this, that um, if you wear certain clothes, it makes you behave. Or you take on a different demeanour. Not that you behave differently, exactly, but you have a different... You walk differently. I think for you to walk in your shamtab, it makes you walk differently, doesn't it, because you were wearing a skirt. Mm -hmm. And um, it's connected with the practice of um, what we would call wearing the body of visions, which is actually wearing the appearance of the yidam. Um, because one's whole world is connected with practice. Um, if you're engaged in visualisation practice of a yidam in, down in the shrine room and you finish your practice and you get up and walk away, you don't leave that behind. You take it out into the world with you as much as possible. So I think the, the connection with clothing is, is connected with moving into that practice. It's also about appreciation and it goes into cooking, it goes into every aspect of life that... Um, I think one of the things that is not really understood concerning compassion is that compassion is not simply wanting the whole world to have a cookie. Uh, it is appreciative. One of the things that's important in, um, in terms of compassion can be seen really in the advice they give you uh, as a counsellor. But if you ever get a client you don't like, you have to refer that client because you can't help a person you don't like. So it's important that you appreciate 
your client, otherwise you can't help. Um, so there's this communicative aspect that, that, that goes through all the arts, which is why clothing is an art, uh, especially in terms of Vajrayana. I think in the West there used to be this, I, I think there still is a, a divide between art and craft, that art is something high and craft is looked down upon. Um, that wouldn't be the case with Vajrayana. That everything that is created, whether it's perfume, whether it's food, whatever it is, poetry, painting, dance, uh, they're all arts and they're all equal. There's no hierarchy of the senses. Uh, there's no hierarchy also for concept consciousness in terms of what is written as poetry or what is created in that way. So um, one of the things that both Konzan Dojo Rinpoche and Dojo Rinpoche emphasized was that uh, you know, to be a Vajrayana practitioner is to be an artist. And so it's, it's important to explore the arts. Not everyone is going to be that wonderful at every art, but um, what everybody has is a place that they live and clothes that they put on. So this is a basic thing in which anyone can invest if they want to. And it doesn't have to be expensive either. You know, I, I, I wouldn't like anyone to get the idea that um, it costs a lot to do this. You simply have to iron your trousers um, Having had a German mother, I starch everything. Uh, you know, I like to get the shirts like cardboard. You know, <laughs> can you can you say a bit more about um, uh, the connection between wearing the wearing the appearance of the yidam and clothing, or maybe just how one does carry that um, body of the yidam off of the cushion that you were describing there. Well, I think that uh, the main point is that uh, care and attention are taken and that you explore your appreciative faculties uh, to the best of your ability. This naturally leads on to um, becoming an individual. The older I get, the more, I, well, both of us realise that most of the world is driven by fashion. Uh, fashions in everything, fashions in politics, fashions in religion. You can see it at the moment. You can almost tell who's going to be the anti-Brexit person because you, all you have to know is their background and you're going to know what they vote. And, you, uh, and it makes us wonder how much have you thought about this in either direction, either for or against. So there's a fashion for, a fashion against... There seems to be a fashion for everything. And it's breaking out of those fashions uh, by learning how to appreciate, how to become an individual by actually allowing the sense fields to function. You know, looking at things and wondering what your relationship with them is, not in an intellectual way, but simply color, form, whatever it is. And once you start to appreciate, then you can become an individual. Having become an individual, then that becomes apparent to other people. And the compassion of the whole situation is what sparks people off into things. Um, we have a student um, in California who, for most of his life, has desired a Jimi Hendrix jacket. You know, the green one with the frogging that actually belongs to a veterinary corps. Um, and so one day I said to him, you know, why not just buy it? You know? And he thought this was a sort of a rather outrageous idea because it was fairly expensive. I said, well, you're going to wear it for the rest of your life, aren't you? Uh, you're probably going to wear it out, so is it expensive? And so he finally went for it. And um, he's had a fascinating time with it on aircraft, everywhere. People speak to him wherever he goes. Uh, and so a whole wealth of human communication has opened up there. And uh, the interesting thing is it's not a thing I'd wear. Well, it's not that I'd reject wearing it. If you gave it to me, I'd wear it. But I mean, but I love seeing him in it. So it's not that 
it it has to be something you'd want to wear, but you see somebody else wearing something that expresses what they are, and that's communicative. And that is all part of bodhicitta, because bodhicitta is vast. It's not just contained in uh, moral, ethical, altruistic principles. It's pervasive. Uh, It's a natural phenomenon. You know, it's not... It doesn't only exist as this codified thing of wanting all beings to achieve realization. That is a really narrow view of it. Of course it's that, but it's far more than that in that it permeates everything. And the more in tune with it you become, the more powerful it it gets. And this is what I meant about leaving the cushion behind. Because in your life, the more reminders you have about practice the better so the idea of um, walking away from the shrine room as Pamas and Bhavri or Yeshit Sogyal that then alters the way that you behave in life Um, and it's the circumstances of your life that are the reminders to practice so you might be less likely to um, suddenly be taken aback, at, angry at your child for doing something unpredictable for a moment. You, it might give you that just space of the moment so that you don't launch forth. You just have more of a sense of spaciousness. These are 1850s. This one actually arrived uh, in a parcel from the States anonymously uh, saying, happy birthday, have fun. And so I, I, I unwrapped it and I thought, blimey, what's this? And uh, I never had any great interest in guns. And um, so one of my students said, oh, you can put firing caps on this and make it go bang. I thought, oh, that's interesting. And so, so I thought, I'll learn how to... So I wasn't better. I've not twirled them for a long time. You but had to I, I had to practice. I skinned my knuckles, but eventually I got to be able to twirl both of them. Let's see if I can still do it. You know, I've not done this for a long time. One. But then it's cocking them as well at the same time. Then, if I was clever, I can get them going two different directions. No, I can't. Well, I used to be able to. But... So, yes, they're... Um... They're amazing old things. And uh, it was through getting that that I discovered that uh, I actually quite enjoy shooting. I used to shoot when I was young, you know, air rifle in the garden. Um, and uh, I used to quite enjoy that. But um, a handgun is much nicer for me than rifle because I'm right handed, left eyed which means there's nothing you can do with a rifle really well. And I found I was a much better aim with a handgun than I am with a rifle. It's um, a a wonderful meditative thing. Have you ever shot a gun? It's this moment where you're on target and you make the mistake of lingering to make sure and you've lost it. <laughs> Happens every time. So when you get that still point, you have to squeeze exactly then, no thought. And uh, so it's it's really very interesting working like that. And um, I was talking to um, a touch and Rinpoche students one time, and uh, they were sort of a little bit troubled that uh, Buddhist teachers should be shooting weapons and. Uh, they were talking about them being um, bad things, you know. And I said, you know, this is really part of the Judeo-Christian mindset of God and the devil. But if there's a devil, then there are works of the devil and they're going to lead you into whatever. I said, this is not a Buddhist idea. This gun is an inanimate thing. It has no intentions. 
guns don't shoot people. People shoot people. They use guns to do that. But you could use a brick to do that or, 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 or whatever, an iron bar or... Or if you watch The Godfather, even a pair of spectacles. Do you remember that bit where he gets the spectacles and it goes into the eye and into the brain? I mean, no one designed the spectacles to do that, but I guess you could use them for that if you were skillful enough. You could say they didn't see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, so then I said to them, well, what about archery? And they said, oh, archery's another matter. That's a peaceful sport. And I said, well, you know, tell the French Agincourt what a peaceful sport it was. The bow and arrow is a military weapon, or was. It's just not anymore. But, um, and wearing robes at the time, I said, besides, haven't you heard about the Buddhist right to bear arms? Oh, well, uh, I was sleeveless at the time, you see, so... But they finally accepted it was uh, all right. Uh, Tatum Roche came to stay with us in Penarth once. And, um, and in this house, in our old Yeah, in our old house. And once he heard we had a handgun there, it, it was an um, air gun, mm-hmm. which he really enjoyed shooting in the garden. And he said, um, he said, I have a gun back at my centre. He said, but I don't tell my students they don't like guns. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, uh, you know, th- 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 there are a lot of attitudes. You know, it's a package. Uh, one has to accept a package uh, mm. with whatever. You know, you can't be a free-thinking Tory. You can't be a free-thinking socialist. You've got to buy the packet. Mm. Um, and I remember in San Francisco there was a gay shooting club called the Pink Pistols. And the local council were trying to close them down. And the NRA, the the National Rifle Association, um, came to their defence. These men are our brothers. Now, a more homophobic group than the NRA, you can't imagine, but these men are our brothers, they shoot. And um, the uh, spokesperson, spokesman for the Pink Pistols said, uh, it's easier to tell other shooters I'm a gay than tell a, another gay I'm a shooter. He said, I didn't buy the package, you know, I, I, I'm just gay, you know. It, it doesn't mean I vote this way, vote that way, that, you know, uh, there is no package. But there's a Buddhist package too, you know, in the West, and, uh, uh, you know, in the Tricycle magazine some 10 years ago, they had a whole thing about you can't call yourself a Buddhist unless you're vegetarian. I think, well, that, that discounts the entire Tibetan population, you know, barring a few here and there over the centuries. Um, and how anyone's got the audacity to make a statement like that, you know. Uh, you know, as the converts to another religion, you know, laying down the law as to how it works... But the package is a big problem everywhere, you know. There's probably a humanitarian package, an atheist package. And so we like to try to encourage people not to buy the package. You know, buy what you want, mm-hmm. not the package. Think, think for yourself. Because that really corrupts people. They take on all kinds of things mm-hmm. that they might not really want to take on. And... Um, What's the difference between thinking for yourself and taking what you want and, say, a concept like integrity of a lineage or something like this? Um, It's it's like integrity to behaviour, really, because there's that psychological experiment, um, isn't there, where um, they got a group of people in and they had to give electric shocks to um, the victims on the instruction of a person in a white coat. So, and, and it seemed to be extremely difficult for people to resist that, the authority of the white coat and the fact that you were supposed to do it, this was the instruction. So, so that sort of um, tendency to animal realm behaviour, herd, herd-like mentality, leads you into... Um, 
behavior patterns that you wouldn't otherwise go into if you thought for yourself, if you thought with a degree of integrity to your, um, what you sent, what, what you thought was right and wrong. I think you, what we mean by the package is what is there in addition to the thing as advertised. <laughs> So you've got the Buddhism, but then you've got the package in which it exists. And people create parts mm. of the package. Mm. And there's a Western package that, that tends to go along with it that is not actually part of Buddhism at all. It's a package. It's like a set of programmed behaviors that go along mm. with, it might be clothing, ways of behaving. Mm -hmm. um, thought principles, it's almost like the thought police of, of the Buddhist Western world. So one has to be careful. I, had, I mean, I heard one student saying, I, you know, I, I thought this was a, a socialist sangha. I said, no, it, it's, it's, it's an apolitical sangha. If somebody's interested in the teaching, I mean, I'd accept a Tory as much as I'd accept anybody. They'd have to be interested in the teaching and they'd have to be Buddhist first, rather than Tory first. And on the same principle, they'd have to be Buddhist first and not socialist first. As long as you're Buddhist first, you can be a Buddhist, and then politics is simply a way of adjusting samsara. And there are things to be said within a moderate framework for either side. Um, I don't really see that... Uh, that one has to define Buddhism in political terms, especially in terms of political correctness. I mean, that, that doesn't really play. I remember Kunzang Dojo Rinpoche used to tease people <laughs> about that. Uh, there was one person who came from California, and um, he decided to tease him uh, on political terms, and he said, I think America should drop a nuclear bomb on China. And the poor man said, but a lot of innocent people would die. He said, yeah, a lot of guilty ones too. <laughs> just, the poor man was horrified until he, he realized Kunzo Toshubashi was just winding him up on the subject. <laughs> it was a rare find, this one. That's an early made class string tallies, or is that a custom job? They don't, it's a custom, it's a custom shop. This is a weird uh, thing about appreciation. I never liked the shape of a Telecaster. I never liked this horn thing here. Until one day I understood it. I realized this is not a horn. This is a cutout. And I suddenly realized it was entirely Art Deco. This straight line across here, and this plate here that looks like it came off a washing machine, you know, these knobs, it, it's, it's got a kind of a, a fabulous ugliness to it. I now love the things, it, but it, it, it flipped completely from not understanding the shape to getting an idea of it. It's... Uh, uh, if, if you choose to stay over, this is the this is the guest bedroom in here. Oh, savage cabbage! Yes, all all those people who bar the heads were posed by our son Robert. I just had photographs of the old band, their faces, and, um, and the whole thing's a Photoshop job. So R Robert just dressed up as the band members, held the guitars, and I photographed him and just worked it all into, into this. How many books have... You written now? I think about a dozen, I think. Mm. I've lost count. And the books we're working on as well. Uh, what are you working on at the moment? Um, we're working on um, a book on the 84 Mahasiddhas. 
Oh, cool. In four volumes, the stories um, from the Terma of uh, Jomo Pema Erzer. That's not a translation. That's a retelling. Yes. When, when I was with Konzang Don Rinpoche and he was telling me the stories of Zapaltrol, and he made an emphasis on telling me that I should tell the stories in a way that Western people would enjoy to hear them, in a Western style and not to copy a Tibetan style or his style. So, so that's what I did in the book, Wisdom Eccentrics, and that's what I do with the 84 Mahasiddhas as well. So um, there's the essential story, but then Kandra Dech and I have um, turned those into short stories in a relatively Western style. The stories are, are, are really fascinating in terms of how they bring out the Mahasiddha principle. Each one does it. The whole quality of the teacher working with the student is there. That is wonderful in these stories from um, Jomo Pema Erzea. You know, um, you know, the idiot is an idiot. And he's taught as an idiot, but his quality as an idiot is is worked with, you know, uh, and uh, which is advantage. Yes, it's the advantage Mm. of being an idiot. Mm. And to work out what the advantage of being an idiot is, you've got to say, what's the opposite of an idiot? An intellectual is the opposite of an idiot. Then you have to look at what are the disadvantages of being an intellectual? You can twist anything. You know, you can find excuses for everything because you're so clever. You can be highly manipulative. An idiot's too stupid for that. Mm. So they're absolutely blunt and direct and will just do as they're told. Yeah. <laughs> and so this comes I know out. Questions. <laughs> just get on with it. So with each the Mahasiddha, the thief, the prostitute, everyone, that really comes out in these stories. So that's it's been Nice to um, clad these stories in, uh, with conversation, obviously, that wasn't in the stories, but to make them a believable um, um, account. Mm. Mm. Uh, and the nice thing about them is that they've, the practice instructions of the teacher to the disciple are very explicit. So the whole book becomes... A practice manual, mm-hmm. um, which is great. What's one of, I don't think that's been done before, has it? Flashing them out in that in a, no. in a readable no. way like that. What's um, uh, what's one of your favourite of those stories, Kandra Um Ooh, yeah. I think the one about Shyama, the cloud weaver. Um, there are an, quite a few women in the stories in the Arrow Tear, um, as opposed to the um, no, more conventional set of Mahasiddha stories. Um, this one is about um, this lady who was just so vague that she couldn't really lead a functional life. She couldn't remember where she... Uh, she couldn't complete a task because she'd get distracted um, by marvelling at something or, or whilst engaged in another activity. So she sort of drifted around in a very sort of vague way. Um, but when something caught her attention, it, it really did catch her attention. Um, and the whole gist of the story is that she meets her teacher um, because she gets lost. She wanders down the river and looks at the river and looks at the willow trees and looks at the water... And um, then she crosses over the river and she can't remember how to get home then because she turns in the wrong direction when she's trying to retrace her steps. And she um, meets a teacher who gives her instructions, very um, simple instructions on looking at the water and looking at the clouds and looking at the, um, the leaves moving in the wind on the branches and because these are things that she's naturally drawn to looking at anyway, they become her practice. And um, she doesn't get distracted. And so she achieves realisation through her um, 
concentration on on objects of nat- natural objects that um, natural things rather than having to complete a task or a sort of a conventional task shall we say first thing that one would think to do with someone like that would be to teach them to not get distracted mm. yeah I think that's one of the <clears throat> great differences between the Mahasiddha tradition of India and what existed later, because uh, Vajrayana was never really designed to be taught to hundreds of people in a room, or even 50 people in a room. Uh, it was one-to-one a lot of the time. And whenever you try to communicate anything to a group of people, uh, it becomes a group teaching, and a group teaching is essentially different from a one-to-one teaching. So that you're not uh, able to use the person's personality. You can only do that one-to-one. But that used to be essential to Vajrayana. That's where it began in India. And uh, it's lost that. It's lost that for various reasons, uh, largely political, largely in terms of uh, the predominance of, of a school, or a lineage needing to build monasteries. Um, And then once you have a monastery, you've got to maintain it, so you need an income. You see, the interesting thing, the word drupta or sadhana, uh, I'm not a Sanskrit scholar, but uh, the Tibetan word drupta means method of accomplishment. Uh, Now, if you use the word drupta, everybody thinks you mean a chanting text. And the chanting text is a drupta. It's not that it's not, but then picking your nose could be a drupta, or anything your teacher asks you to do could be a drupta. Uh, one of my favorite examples of that is not actually a Tibetan story, but a Zen story of the student who says to his teacher, I really need to achieve realization. He bugs his teacher about this sufficiently that the teacher says in the end, right, this is what you have to do. Um, Go up the road some 10 miles. There's a pig farm there. Work on the pig farm and, you know, come back in three years. So he works on the pig farm for three years, comes back. The teacher says, I think you need another three years on the pig farm. He goes back to work on the pig farm. After three years, he comes back. He says, maybe just another three years. He goes back again to work on the pig farm. But before the three years is over, the teacher says to his students for morning, um, we're going on a journey today. We're going to visit a friend of mine. He's a great master. He works on a pig farm. And so uh, this whole idea of drubtub is is there in that, that... Um, certainly, I mean, we teach Shine La Tong Yime Lundru just as you, well, Shamar Vipassana. Uh, the reason we don't use the Sanskrit words is because they have a particular meaning in Dzogchen, and Shamata, as it's practiced in Dzogchen, is not the same, so we call it Shine. It's very similar, but there are some important differences. I mean, sure, this is a standard practice that will achieve an end, but The thing is that you've already got your practice in who you are. That is your starting point. Now, I can ignore that starting point and say, right, this is what you do. Or I can take your starting point into account and work from there. Or this is what the Mahasiddha would do. Look at you and say, who are you? Where are you going? Usually these people are in trouble of some sort, and so they'd say, you know, I can help you. <laughs> and, and the help would be spiritual help rather than getting the gambler out of his awful situation or, or getting the thief out of his awful situation. But uh, they had a pressing need to do something different. Of course, it's very hard in this society to do that because we don't live in a society where we expect there to be Mahasiddhas hanging around. That is not there for most ordinary people. Most of these siddhas were ordinary people 
who just stumbled on some Mahasiddha by accident. And the Mahasiddha happened to see that this person is at the right point that I could really help them in terms of exactly who they are. So naturally all these qualities of Shine, Latong, Nime, Lundrup, the Four Nile Jaws uh, are also part of how they taught, but they were the um, they were the tools rather than the main thing. They were aspects of how they taught. And so you can see those aspects coming out in terms of how Shyama was taught in terms of concentration, but in a very different way. It was not ignoring who she was. So that's, that comes out in all the stories. Um, what, what, what tends to come out of them is a sense in people hearing them that, oh, there's a chance for me then. I could do something, you know, that I, um, with all my foibles or, or however I'm constructed, there is a way of working, you know, and that, that's something I've got already in terms of being a moron. Um, I'm very fond of a moron because um, I have an IQ of 66, which makes me officially a moron. Do you, do you know about that categorization? I think below 70 and you're a moron, so I, I, I wear that with pride. I don't think it would be called a moron these so, days, though. No, I, I know, but I just love the term, and so I can say I get my six with that, I get my kicks with an IQ of sixty six. Can I interrupt? Would it be good if we sat down? Yeah. yeah. <laughs>